heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as front lids between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here the Lord God is giving the instruction to the children of Israel as they are about to enter the promised land, and it will not be an easy entrance. In fact, war is about to occur. But it is a war that has been declared by God and not man. In fact, it is the only war that you can truly call a holy war. For God has judged the nations which are to be overthrown because of their evil. And so God is now instructing Israel that they are to be a holy people, a holy nation. And as one progresses the book of Deuteronomy, which was written right before entering into that land, the entire book is a book of blessing and cursing upon God's people, depending on their loyalty to Him. In fact, when you read chapter 28 through 30, it is very revealing because it actually tells the entire history of Israel in two chapters. But the point and principle that we want to draw here is that it begins with the family. He assigns the fathers, the mothers of the household to retaining, to preserving the spiritual legacy and the moral legacy and thereby preserving the integrity of the household and by so doing, the nation can be preserved. As we spoke our past lessons on the re reclaiming the family, we spoke of the things that has brought the culture in America and in turn the world to the state in which it is. For America has, begun, has become the greatest influence of the world for the last 50 years. And of course, our moral condition usually results in the moral condition of the world as a nation. The last element that we had considered was the element that we have found ourselves in, the cultural condition that involves every individual in the nation. And it begins in the home, the sense of alienation. Everything that we have experienced from the cultural descent and the cultural challenge has brought us to a sense of alienation in America. There is an alienation from God. God has become repulsive to us. So we either completely re ignore him or we simply relegate him to the church building. And then we feel alienation from nature. Now we believe nature is hostile to us. Every now and then we're getting reports of some comet coming to destroy us, some natural catastrophe that's going to end the world because of the moral descent of the nation. And we are alienated from others. Society has become dangerous to live in. And then we are alienated to ourselves. We feel no personal significance and find no meaning or purpose to life. Because of this estrangement has settled in, there is a loss of the sexes in America. There is reverse sexual identity in America. There is a loss of age distinction that has brought about a predominant age of pedophilia in America and the world. And there is an estrangement in the loss of personal hope. Drug abuse is higher than it ever was today. 
and suicide along with it. So the only hope for the postmodern culture is God and the Christian family. There is no other hope. So we are speaking of the cultural challenge this morning, what we call the survival of the family. It must be stipulated upon the type of context that we have just read this morning. It begins in the home. It begins with the parents. It begins with the mother. It begins with the father. It begins with the children. It is the only way to rescue a nation that is post-mortem in its corruption. The family must stay spiritually focused by preserving a spiritual perspective. Spirituality must be priority in the household. Christ must be the center of the home. How many of us here today who call ourselves Christian have taken time to sit with our families and dedicate our home to Jesus Christ? How many of us have done that? Some of us have lived in our homes 50, 60 years and have never stood there in the middle of the house and dedicated our home to Jesus Christ. The family must stay spiritually focused and it begins with dedicating all we are and have to Jesus our Lord. Our children are the most sacred possession we have. Unfortunately, many of us don't find out until we reach our grandchildren what our most precious possessions really are. And our familial stewardship is the most sacred of our responsibility on this planet. Family first, always family first. A man can become so busy that he forgets who his family is, that he forgets everything he does is about his family. And the most revealing characteristic of any nation is what it does with its children. What are we doing with our children as parents, as a society? I recall a few years ago in West Texas attending a teacher seminar where the superintendent gave a presentation of the education, an amazing presentation with PowerPoint and all types of uh, schematic uh, illustrations, and he was re referring to how even the early childhood development, uh, the way the children used blocks and clay modeling and so forth was used so that the child would develop and, and have skills and so forth. And at the end of the whole thing, everyone applauded. Even I applauded. I thought it was wondrously done. But then he asked, does anyone have any questions? And, uh, no one had a question and uh, arose inside me somewhere something that made me think about all that because I realized with all this, with all of this multi-billion dollar educational system, look at our children. When 80% of our prisoners in our prisons are 17 to 25 years old. What has education done for them? And so I did raise my hand and looked startled that anyone should have a question after that amazing presentation. And I said, Mr. Superintendent, I said, I want you to know that I feel we've done a wonderful job with your presentation. I feel that we have an incredible system of education, but I want to ask a question. With all of these things and all this skill and intellectual building of our children, what kind of children are we attempting to produce? 
And, and he stood there and he looked at me and he said, uh, I don't understand. I said, what is the objective in all of this for the children? Is there something missing? And you know, he looked startled and he told me and he said, you know, I don't know. I don't know why, what, what the objective is, he told me, other than what I've told you. No one's asked the question before. And so after it ended, we had a long conversation about the moral fiber that must be woven into the character of the children or they will disintegrate at the power of the forces that overcome them in this world. And I pointed out to him that I believe the only place to find that would be in a home that was dedicated to Jesus Christ. So what are we trying to do with the children? A nation will reveal what it really is with what it does with its children. The same is true of the family. What are we doing with our children as a family? Oh sure, we'll go out on boat rides and hunting and fishing and a lot of these events that go on. But what are we doing about character? What are we doing about understanding virtue and implanting those spiritual principles in their souls that will help them to mature into what God intended them? What has become of your children? Where do you find yourself in the lives of your children today? There is a danger in careless, in careless parenting. I want to read a word from you from Dr. Albert Cole of Union University and Seminary in Chicago. He says, more young people are exposed to social radicalism by the churches than any other agencies combined. The year 1922. And Dr. Edwin Barrett of Cornell University and Law School, 1939, said, the religious experience of men and women become the decisive factor and ultimate court of appeal by which we test the validity of any concept, especially the concept of God. What he's saying is the way children learn God is the way they will live their lives. And they only learn the most important truths and realities about God at home and nowhere else. The survival of the family is only possible by the survival of the spiritual and moral fiber of the household, of the home. It all begins there, it all ends there. It's amazing because I recall going to uh, the doctor's office at one point and taking my little one to see the doctor, and there was a poem on the wall. And I wrote down and tried to remember what I could about it, and I'm going to sh share it with you today. It's, it's about children. It was called The Beauty of Children. And this is what it says. Children are God's gift. Treasure them. Amazing. Appreciate them. Believable, trust them. Grown, allow them. Sacred, honor them. Energetic, nourish them. Fallible, reinforce them. Temporarily yours, be with them. Innocent, delight with them. Joyful, enjoy them. Kind-hearted, learn from them. Lovable, cherish them. Magical, fly with them. Noble, esteem them. 
open-minded, share with them precious, value them, pure, respect them, inquisitive, acknowledge them, resourceful, support them, dependent, provide for them, spontaneous, enjoy them, talented, believe in them, unique, recognize them, vulnerable, protect them, special, celebrate them, yearning, encourage them, playful, play with them, and in turn, they will imitate you. Jesus said in Luke 18, 16, and 17, Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. There is something about children that is absolutely precious and sacred. And we as parents must understand that. And that, and understand that it incurs tremendous responsibility on us as parents. The challenge of the culture is what we must understand. And we must in turn challenge the culture with Christian families. A Christian family today is a challenge to this culture. In fact, this culture is not interested in Christian families. And I believe that is partly because there has been a fragmentation of the culture and the family. The culture is so brought up that the family no longer plays an important role in the culture. And a Christian family is a completely foreign entity to the culture. But if the culture is exposed to the members separately and individually of the family, of the Christian family, and see the beauty of the individual, they will then begin to inquire and to seek, and then can the family minister to this culture. There is a passage in Ephesians chapter 5, and I want us to really understand that when we read these passages, there are principles that are eternal. Whatever you read in scripture, there is a treasure in there called principles. And principles are good for all people for all times, always. But if we do not see the principle, then we do not understand the beauty of the scriptures. Let's understand, I want to make that clear, this book is not of this world. This is not a man-created book. The Bible came from somewhere that's not the earth. And it's not of the earth. Having studied comparative religions, having gone through hundreds of so-called holy texts of the pagan world, I was more and more convinced that there is no book like the Bible. Not one. It does not compare. I challenge you to go check it. Does not come near it. There is nothing like the Bible. One of the most amazing elements about the Bible to me, just in side note, just so you'll understand and you can tell your children, is that the Bible is rooted in human history. And yet it demonstrates a divine and supernatural element involved. There is something above it. There is something above humanity that is controlling the events. No other book on the face of this earth has that element in it. And that's just one of the hundreds of elements that demonstrate to us that this book is not from man. It comes from God. And when we put to test the principles that are stated and taught in this book, you will understand the reality of the power of the book. 
Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. Look at what it says. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Do you see that? First of all, the Christians are a family. And God is our Father. If you didn't know that, it's time you found out. It's a family. Why? Because the family is the most powerful, the most powerful social institution in the world. There is where you learn to live with each other. There is where you learn to accept each other. There it is you learn to belong and to love each other. There it is where you learn to heal one another. And if it begins in the family, then you can produce a society and a nation and a world that is as beautiful. But if you do away with the family, everything else goes with it. Everything. Twenty-six civilizations are laying in the dust today. They all began to collapse when they began to violate the home when they began to do away with marriage between man and woman, when they began to separate the children from the parents, when everything began to fall into the categories that go with it, then the whole cultures began to collapse, and they lie in the de dust forever today. And let me say something. America is no exception. So he begins it with a powerful, eternal principle. He says, be imitators of God as dear children. You are a family. God is your father. He's not a monster out there wanting to kill you or destroy you. There's not a sign hanging over your head saying, no fun. He says, I love you, I will show you how to live, and it will be fun. You will enjoy it. You will be full of joy, of the beauty that will come from that in your character and your person. Everything about it will be worthwhile to you. Verse 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. You see, that smells one thing, beauty. The beauty of holiness and purity and godliness. It's all there. It's all there. And so it all begins there. He says, I want you to understand this. This is how your life is to be. You are a family, and this goes in the household as well as any other place in the world. And so, as we read this, he drops up to verse 15. Notice in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly simply means be aware. Be aware. He says, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. What does that mean? It means this. Without a moral fiber in life, without a moral and spiritual perspective in life, then all you're going to get out of it are things that are, that are destined to cause nothing but, mim but uh, misery and shipwreck. Always remember that. Every life that says, no one tells me what to do, there is no right and wrong, I do what I feel like, always ends up in a mess. Always. I remember studying philosophy. I think I read about 250 philosophers, all the way up to Bertrand Russell, John Paul Sartre, Michel Foucault, Jacques, Derrida, all 
all these men that have taught our college student and ruined generations by telling them, live as please. No one can tell you what to do. Life is meaningless, etc., etc. But when you look at their lives, you realize that their philosophies are empty and destructive. So when you read a philosopher in college, young people, go check out his background. Go see what he lives like. Go see what they live like. And you're going to find out that it's not recommendable because consequences have, uh, excuse me, because ideas have consequences. They always do. So we must understand the Christian family has a mission in this world to minister to those they live with. God has assigned every Christian family to minister to the community it lives in. Each member of the Christian family has a distinct role for preserving the family and influencing the community for Jesus Christ. The Christian is continuously challenged by cultural appeals. Integrity is essential to spiritual survival. Understand who we are. Understand each other's needs. Understand the zeitgeist, the world spirit, the world life that surrounds us. Because it is a moving current. And if we do not understand it, it will take us with it. Discern the distinction between spirituality and carnality. Know the difference. Anything we reason as Christians that is to our convenience is carnality. Remember that. The world spirit has involved the church through counterfeit spirituality. Many have been deceived by the culture and have become distorted Christians. The kind of man that can be at church and even be a deacon or even an elder in the church, and on Tuesday he's a ruthless real estate man with the old adage that is sung in hell, business is business. I've seen it. You've seen it. Even the concept of salvation can be nothing more than an infatuation with one's self-importance, displaying itself in a purely humanistic set of religious ideas that do not correspond to reality. The Christian must remain relevant without assimilating, understand it without becoming it, Beware of the secular. Avoid trafficking in unlived truth. It's one thing to know truth. It's another to live it. And that is the tremendous challenge of the age for the Christian. I want to read something in closing with you. It will seem a little negative, but I want it to be something that will open our eyes. There was a book written a while back, about 40 years back, so you'll know it didn't come from me, by Dr. Harry Blanders. He's an English professor. He wrote this in something called The Secular Christian. It's a, in his book. He says this. I want you to pay close attention. It says, In postmodern religious circles, there is no longer a genuine spiritual mentality. There is, for the most part, no longer a Christian mentality. This is 1943. There is, of course, a Christian ethic, a Christian practice, a Christian moral being. The Christian subscribes to a code of ethics different from that of the non-Christian. As a member of a church, he understands his obligation and observes practices which mean nothing to the non-Christian. He prays, he meditates, he attends church services, and tries to live as the non-Christian does not. 
because as a thinking being, the modern Christian has succumbed to secularism. His religion, his morality, worship, and devotional life are segregated from his secular social life and isolated. He even incorporates his churches, wears titles and signs and religious contracts without being aware that his secular mind has become his religious mind. His work, he works and he lives side by side with the non-Christian. He talks of plans, politics, economics, weather, family, sports, etc. And not once in a religious context, it is for all purposes useless. An absolutely secular relationship void of any spirit, spiritual integrity. The Christian gradually divest, divests himself of the habit of thinking spiritually and then it's, and it's assimilated into a secular mentality, observing, speaking, judging, and acting on a secular non-spiritual sub-level. The secular Christian is transformed into a pragmatic schizophrenic, a jackal and hide, who evolves back and forth between two contrary worldviews and mental states. The shift is costly, despiritualizing, carnalizing, and self-defeating. The impression is left that to be a Christian is to abandon the mind and distort reality. And he finishes, how can such a Christian expect to change the world? How can such a Christian save his own children? When in reality, he has a complete contradiction, a complete hoax. You see, it's the Christian's responsibility to be informed, to be aware, to understand for the sake of his household. You are out there learning and researching and, and getting uh, data and, and whatever is necessary together. It's to save your household. It's for your children's sake. It's to be able to give them a spiritual heritage that can meet the challenges of a postmodern godless culture. I want to end with these words. Only when we repent, truly repent, and turn back to our merciful and loving Creator for direction and guidance. Only then can we discover the power of regeneration and revival and the spiritual life that is anchored in the life of God and lived in the soul and the spirit. Then and only then can truth be lived, morality anchored and evil understood and conquered and the soul restored. And only then can the family reclaim its power in the culture. Have you come to the Son of God today? Today is the day of salvation if you choose. Today is the day of restoration if you choose. As the Apostle writes, for he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Can you hear the voice of the Lord calling? In 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, we're going to find something interesting. This is the second letter, of course, that the Apostle Paul has sent to these Christians and uh, it's, it's so important the matters that he's having to deal with and it is obvious from this letter that there are still some complications with this church in Corinth but he is of course writing to try to uh, help these Christians get through life, get through the challenges of the times which they lived in and so let's see there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and read a few verses, beginning in verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you my, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in the presence and lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. 
But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For our weapons of our war, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Here in the challenge, as we said again, is a cultural challenge. It always has been. Always remember that when the New Testament is written to Christians, when all these things are said, we must remember that the sum total of it means it is the instructions and it is the teachings and the principles that are given so that we can learn to survive the culture in which we live. This has been the case in each and every one of the centuries and generations in which the Christians have lived throughout history. When we take the Bible and make it irrelevant to the culture in which we live, we have done a tremendous injustice to ourselves and to God's Word. It is not a book to be taken as some ideological textbook to hide us somewhere in some isolated area, but it is there to give us the power to live for Christ in the culture in which we live. It is ours to mature. It is ours to become spiritually capable of understanding and perceiving and being able to live in this culture, in whatever culture we live in, and to make Christianity real to us and to those around us. So as we said this morning, it is the Christian's responsibility to be informed about the world he or she lives in. The arena of knowledge and information is the battleground for today's most crucial war, and it is being fought intensely and relentlessly by the other side, the side that wants to seduce the entire world into forgetting God and living godless lives. So we must remember it is a war that is waged on the human soul, and the avenue to the human soul is the human mind. That is why the Apostle says here, we, we, our, our weapons are not carnal. That is, they're not of human intellect and passions. They come from the Spirit of God, because the war is spiritual. And he says, it's mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The word stronghold here refers to ancient warfare, where the enemy would build encampment around the city was about to capture, and they'd build walls around the city walls and keep them in there and would not allow any communication to those outside. It would not allow any way of escape outwards. It would isolate them to the point where they be, would begin to wither, to starve, to have nothing to survive and to wage war against these strongholds. And eventually the enemy would come in and take the city almost with no resistance because the city by that time had been starved to death. This is very important because if all the Christians are feeding on mentally and spiritually and psychologically are these cultural strongholds that have been set up against the church and the Christian home, then the Christian family is doomed to defeat. So what are we doing? What are we doing to understand the culture so that we can bring down these intellectual strongholds that are set up against the Christian home? All you have to do is look at your educational system. 
what is the, the most common and basic doctrine taught in our educational system? Evolution. That man is not God's creation, but some descendant of the amoeba in some ancient soup. And it is absolutely absurd. And yet it has the garbs of intellectual education. And now it's gone even further. Now the educational system is teaching Hinduism with a new garb, as we had described in our earlier series. And that new age garb is being called all types of names. It is even celebrated one day a year called Earth Day. And so we have these strongholds that are attacking the Christian home. And it is the responsibility of every Christian parent to be informed about these things. Or you will be gullible. Your children are gullible. And they have lost the battle long before it has begun for them. It is an age of information. If we do not understand, if we are not aware, then we can be taken by these things that are invading our culture. I want to quote to you what C.S. Lewis of Magdalen College, Oxford University said. By the way, he is the one who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and many other books. But he wrote in one of his books these words. He said, uh, to be ignorant and simple now not to be able to meet the enemies on their ground would be to throw down our weapons and betray our uneducated brethren who under God have no defense but us against intellectual heathen. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. So you see, it is an age that we must be informed. In 1 Peter chapter 3, toward the end of the first century, the Apostle Peter writes to Christians who are under persecution, and he instructs them what their position is to be in the culture they live in. It is a culture that is hostile to these Christians. It is a culture that is capturing and imprisoning these Christians, and they are constantly being brought before tribunals and courts to answer for why they are what they are. They basically are being asked, why are you not like the rest of the people? Why do you not worship the idols? Why do you not attend all the parties and pagan drinking and all types of illicit and wicked activities? Why aren't you partaking of all this? This is life. This is the way the world is. Why do you decide to contradict all that? And the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, But sanctify. Well, I want you to see verse 13. Notice how this starts. He says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. And when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ, may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Do you see that? That was the choice. If you live for Christ, the culture says you are evil. You are antisocial. You are a threat to progress. You are a blight on human progress. And we are at that age today. And for parents to not be informed, for grandparents to not be informed in such a way that they can guide their children and their grandchildren is inexcusable. It is selfish. And we must be aware 
of the challenge if we are to meet it. The Christian must understand the times he and she lives in. We cannot evangelize a culture we do not understand. The Christian must understand human nature, being where people are, going where they are, starting where they are. It is so immature for myself to believe that I'm going to preach to a someone who is of a pagan culture and believe they're going to just jump up and leave their culture because I teach them or preach to them directly. I have to understand them. I have to understand where they're coming from. I have to begin where they are if I am going to in any way evangelize them. If you know anyone that's worked with other cultures, for example, the Hindu culture, the Hindu culture will hear you. The Hindu culture will even agree with you, but they will not come to your ideas. They will not come to Christ because to them you are telling them to abandon their culture. You are telling them to abandon their families and everything they've ever believed in in life. You're telling them that they will now be on their own and may even be killed by one of their family members for leaving their culture and their religion. It is not as simple as we presume. You see, America is an autonomous and now even an anarchist culture where every man lives for himself, where every man lives for his own personal passions and drives, and we sacrifice even our own families for it. But the other cultures are not so. They are not as corrupt as we are in that aspect. They still respect their families. They still respect where they came from. They still respect what their culture represents. Unfortunately, America has come so low that even our families have lost their identity. And Hollywood has redefined a family. You know, Hollywood can take two men and a child and a dog and call that a family. Hollywood can take a boy and his pet and call that a family. But it is not God's definition of a family. And we are having to deal with that battle in our own children because when they go to these educational schools, when they see the TV shows, when they watch the movies, they are being told this is reality, not what you are being taught in your church, not what mama and daddy are telling you. This is reality. You know, they even have a day in California where little boys and little girls are taken and made to switch clothes. Isn't that amazing? So that they'll understand the other sex and find the contrary sex in themselves. Do you call that education? I call that corruption. That is manipulation. That is not education. It is horrid when America has to deal with those types of things being presented under the guards of education in, in that dress. The Christian must understand the human nature. He must understand where people are. The Christian must understand the issues we, we must equip the, our young generations adequately with spiritual training to meet the challenges of the culture. We must discern with sincerity the searching and needs of our contemporary culture. We must understand the difference between the essentials and non-essentials of a discussion. Don't get into discussion in areas that don't mean a thing. You know, we had a little encounter with uh, uh, Watchtower people the other morning. And they came in in their usual way with their nice looking little books and their little rhetoric that they're trained to speak and say. But I went to the heart of the issue. Those are my issues for me. My point to the person was this. The Watchtower is a business corporation 
The Watchtower is a multi-billion dollar corporation and it manipulates and uses unsuspecting people to serve their purposes and to fill their pockets. You go to the state treasury of New York, you look it up down there, and you will find that now they not only have one, but I've just found out they have several corporations under the same name. And you will find the names of the stockholders and nominees. And you will find that they have been in the Fortune 500 magazine as one of the top multi-billion dollar corporation businesses in the world. That is the issue. So don't call it religion to me. It is business as usual. And you are the dupe. And I'm telling you this because I want to emphasize never get into discussions with issues that have nothing to do with the real matter of the situation. There's no reason to talk about a man having a scab on his left arm when he's got cancer on his leg. There's no reason to do that. We must understand what the real issues are. We must defer judgment and discussion on peripheral and, ob and obscure subjects. Don't get into areas that they're, that they're, they're not important. They, they have nothing to do with the truth. I've had people come to me and and who, who, who know I'm a minister, who know I've got the, the education I do, and say, well, what do you think about the book of Revelation? I said, well, I think it's not a topic you and I need to be discussing. Amen. I said, the topic you and I need to be discussing is, have you come to Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? That's our topic. And so it's caused many things, and of course some folks don't understand that, but those are the issues and non-issues. Do not get into peripheral areas that have nothing to do. And I tell Christians, what are you doing in the book of Revelations when you should be studying the Beatitudes? You see? And so we have to understand that what the real issue is, what really requires the attention and what does not. The Christian must recognize the urgency of our situation. We must claim lost ground and reclaim our spiritual relationship with God and strive for our spiritual heritage, for our church, for our people, for our families, and for our eternal destinies. The Christian hope, as we said, is the hope of our culture. It is not going to be found anywhere else. If Christians do not preserve their homes, then no message will have credibility. If it doesn't work for you, why should I listen to you? It's that serious. You can't tell a man not to drink alcohol when you own a liquor store. It doesn't work that way. It never has. The Christian home is the final ground of defense for any culture. Once the Christian home is infiltrated, the culture goes. Once the Christian home defragments, the, the, the culture defragments. Once the Christian home declines and is destroyed, the culture declines and destroys because that is where it all begins. The home is a divine heritage. God designed the home. No one else did. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 tells us that God created man and woman in his image and he made them so they would be homes and they would propagate the earth and replenish it. And then in chapter 2 you find God conducting the first marriage ceremony. Isn't that wonderful? when God himself conducted the first ceremony. He says he made the woman out of the men. And then chapter 2 of Genesis, and he says, and he presented the woman to the man. Isn't that awesome? He gave away the first bride. So God sees the home, the marriage, as the most sacred, the most sacred institution in human society. Nothing can replace the home. 
The family is sacred because it is essential to the extension and survival of the human race as God intended it. It is absolutely essential. I want you to hear the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. The religious bigots of the time challenge him and his teaching and they try to, they go to the point of even trying to entrap him. They're not even interested in learning anymore. They want to just entrap him. And in chapter 9, uh, 19 of Matthew, Matthew 19 and verses 3 and to 6, you find these words written. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, it is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now that's a very silly question, isn't it? Why would he want to divorce his, divorce his wife for just any reason? Well, you know, the Talmuds and the writings, if you read them, it says that um, it happy, that it's so absurd, it says, happy is the man that divorces his wife that burns his supper. That's their wisdom. Carnal, ungodly wisdom. And yet that is what they teach. That's what they believe. He goes on to say and said, and, and verse 4, and he answered and said to them, Have you not read, he who made them at the beginning, made them male and female? You see that? He made them male and female. Now I want you to understand, he's quoting Genesis. And if you don't know the original text of the Bible, there is a powerful play here on, on the words. Here is, is, is a different term in the Greek, it's anir and gaina, which is the man and woman, male and female. But if you go to the Hebrew text, it says ish-ha, ish-ha. You see that? ish isha. It describes there is an origin of the same source. It is one. And he goes on to say, there and for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh because originally that's what they were God took a woman out of the man's side he didn't form another body from the mud from the dirt he took her out of the man there's something very serious there. And he goes on to say, six, So then, they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Listen to this, ye judges of the earth. Your divorces means nothing to God unless they correspond God's law. That's so serious. A lot of these judges are going to answer to Jesus for what they do. No judge can annul a marriage unless God has said he can. And that is absolutely essential. But our culture insists that it can do better than what God has said. It insists that it is wiser than God. It insists that their utopia is more beautiful than heaven. Well, having seen that in the last 50, 60 years we've been involved in over 150 wars, I don't think there's much utopia to that. And the present state of things doesn't make it any better, does it? So much for human utopia. So we see that the Lord has said the home, the home, the, the marriage is sacred. The family is a fundamental institution for all coherent social structures and the bedrock of all civilizations. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle tells this young minister how to set things in order in the church. And he tells him how to pick leaders in the church, but he makes the first and prime requisite in the home. In the home. And in 1 Timothy 3, 4, he said, One who rules his own house well. The word 
rule implies to manage it, to guide it. He says, having his children in submission with all reverence. What does that mean? He has taught them to love God. They know how to love God because they have seen it in him. And he goes on to say this, verse 5, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? That sounds logical to me. And if he doesn't even know how to pray in his own home, what's he doing playing the spiritual leader for a church? It's absolutely absurd. It's a shame when there is a man that calls himself a leader in God's people and won't sit down and pray with his children. And he expects to bring people to Christ? Huh. Who are you kidding? It's a hoax. And he goes on to speak of these things and tells who and why. And in verse 15 he says, But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you the minister ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You know, some of our preachers really have a lot to learn from this text. We must understand. I always tell younger men that are wanting to go into ministry, I say, remember one thing. You are the face of the church. And what you do out there, the church has to answer for. You need to know how to conduct yourself, how to manage your life, how to use it, how to use it to bring others to Christ, how to use it to bring your family to love and serve God, how to use it to cause your little boy, your little girl to love no one more and nothing more than the Lord and Savior Jesus. The family is the fundamental institution of all society. Jesus Christ is represented as the as bonded to his church in a family union relationship. The Apostle Paul quotes the first marriage scenario as the point of reference for family unity there in Ephesians chapter 5. Do you recall Ephesians 5 and verses 25 through 35? He does an analogy, he expresses an analogy of the church and then com compares it and brings it in, into the idea and the concept of Christ and the church. And as he, uh, and as he finishes that, Notice what he says in verse 31. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Number th verse 32, notice how he finishes this statement. He says, This is a great mystery. This is profound, he said. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Do you see that? The earliest, most primitive and pictorial example of the church and its relationship to Jesus Christ and is the only element that exists that still corroborates and testifies to the relationship between Christ and the church is the home, the marriage. And as long as the families survive civilization, will survive. And this is our historical warning. When families become extinct, civilization will disintegrate. I want to finish with you tonight with the what I a book that some of you have read perhaps. I believe they even made a movie out of it. And it shows how personal passion can destroy not only the person but everyone around us who we are supposed to love. And may I say this is applicable to the family and to our community and to culture. The picture of Dorian Gray, written by
by the poet Oscar Wilde. In fact, this is the only novel he wrote. And it is believed by many scholars and critics that this novel really represents the very life of Oscar Wilde, who died at the age of 46 from horrible diseases, because he lived a tremendously prolific and evil life. But this book, The Picture of Dorian Gray, is very interesting, and I recommend you reading, understand the moods and the messages and the cries for help that you find in the book, written in the 1800s. In the book, there's a young man named Dorian Gray. He's coming of age, and he's, he's uh, a wealthy young man, and he's introduced to a painter, and the painter just is completely astonished with this young man and his natural beauty. And he tells the young man, you know, I believe you would make a wonderful portrait. Would you allow me to paint you? And he says, yes, I would. And so he paints the portrait and he sets it up. And when he's done, Dorian Gray looks at the portrait and is completely taken by it and says, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do anything we wanted? We could live any way we wanted, and we could remain as beautiful as this portrait here. It's the portrait. And in a Faustian manner, uh, Dorian Gray is granted his desire. And he begins to live a wicked and prolific life. He seduces young women, and there's one particular young girl who loves him and wants to marry him, and he completely uses her and he just drops her and leaves her, leaves her in the shame of society, and she commits suicide. And as the years go by, he runs into the, uh, an, an older friend and whose daughter falls in love with Dorian Gray, little knowing that he's at least already 40 to 50 years older than she is, because he still looks like he's 21 years old. And as time goes, he has to battle. And his friend has to plead with him and say, please, please, Dorian, leave my daughter alone. You know, you know who you are. And you know who she is, what she is. She is an innocent child. Leave her alone. And he eventually does decide to leave her alone, and he goes back to visit the painter for some urging, and he finds that the painter is very disturbed, and the painter has hidden the portrait. And Dorian says, where is the portrait? And he says, uh, it's put up. I'd like to see it. No, you may not see it. Well, in time, he sneaks into the, uh, the studio, finds the picture painted, and he takes off the covering, and the picture is the most horrid thing you could ever see. It is horribly distorted. It's full of all types of sores, diseases, and maggots, and it's just a horrendous picture. And Dorian Gray is horrified. And the painter walks in and says, why did you come here? Why did, and Dorian says, what, what is this? What, what's going on here? What has happened to the, the portrait? And the painter says to him, can you not hear, Dorian? Do you not hear the voice? Come now, let us reason, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, you shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, you shall be as wool. He was quoting Isaiah 1.18. And Dorian Gray is enraged and picks up a knife and kills the painter. And in his rage, he still is full of anger and he looks at the portrait again and he just lunges that knife into the portrait's heart 
And next thing you know, you hear a horrible scream coming out of Dorian Gray. And he falls to the ground dead. And the people downstairs hear the screaming. They run upstairs and they look and they see the two dead men. They can recognize the painter. They see the painting has returned to its pristine beauty. And all the filth and ugliness and rot that was on the picture is now on the body of Dorian Gray, an unrecognizable wretch. The original ideas that shaped this land have been completely distorted and are completely defiled by this culture. Everything has the stench of death on it. It is a culture that has died and is now decomposing. The American family, the Christian family, is the only hope for this culture. It is a call to repentance. It is a call to change. It is a call to action that we must wield in our society, in our communities. And we must ask everyone around us, have you heard the voice of one crying in the wilderness? Repent. Repent. Thus saith the Lord. Call upon his name, and thou shalt be saved. Have you come to the Son of God? If you've strayed, if you've lapsed, have you sought him anew? For he will give you new life, and he will restore you, and he will use you, and you will be what he intended for you to be.